Right. Cool. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Sunday morning. It's one of those Sunday mornings that makes you thankful that we live in the desert, right? 
I'm super sweaty. <laughs> Anyhow, some announcements before we get started this morning. First things first, I'd like to draw your attention to the friendship pads placed on the innermost section of each pew. Go ahead and grab that, fill it out, pass it down when you reach the end of each pew, send it on back. If you are new with us today, I encourage you to write your contact information down so that we can get in touch. And if you don't know the person that you're seated next to, now's a great opportunity to get to know one another. Join us today, immediately following service, as we celebrate Dr. John Romine's 90th birthday. <laughs> he turned 90 on the 27th. And so we're all looking forward to celebrating with him today. And a couple more announcements. Choir practice will resume on Thursday, August 31st at 5.30 p.m. And Bell's rehearsal will resume Monday, August 28th at 5.30 p.m. All right, thanks so much. And let's ready our hearts and minds for worship this morning. What?
we seek the kingdom of God where the smallest seeds turn into great plants. We seek the kingdom of God as precious as pearls or treasure. We seek the kingdom of God where joy and abundance reign. Please stand as you're able and join us in our gathering hymn, hymn number 762. Intercede when we fall short of your glory, when we do not deserve your promises, when we do not act like those who have called your family. Spirit, intercede when our words wound, when our silence speaks volumes, when our actions are a far cry from what you would have us do. Spirit, intercede break forth into our lives, forming us into the image of your Son, that we may never feel separate from you again. Beloved, hear this good news. God is for us. Not even our sins can separate us from the love of God. Glory be to God, God for, for this, this grace, grace and mercy. mercy.
received us, pardoned us, and loved us. Let us forgive each other in love and share the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, we trust that God will bring forth good from that which we offer today. It is our privilege to participate in the unfolding of God's grace in the world. Let us give with grateful and expectant hearts.
one, receive these offerings as you receive our lives, gather our false starts and uncertain efforts, our generosity and our reluctance, enliven us with your breath and make your purposes known that our lives may show forth your glory. For we pray in the name of Jesus and by the power of your spirit. Amen.
our reading from the Epistle of James, if you want to follow along in the Pew Bible, is on page 230 of the New, New Testament section. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself if not accompanied by action, is dead. So ends this reading. Thanks be to God. Hello again. Uh, before we roll into the Romans reading, I'll take a short moment to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shelby, and I am the church administrator here at First Presbyterian Church. I have been for about a year and a half. Uh, this is my first time being up here. <laughs> I'm much more comfortable being in the back where I get to see the back of y'all's heads. Uh, you are far less intimidating from behind, I can tell you that much. <laughs> um, and before we dive in today, I would like to take a page from Kelly Van Sickle's book and just provide a quick disclaimer that um, the thoughts and opinions expressed in this sermon do not necessarily express those of First Presbyterian Church. Um, I have been through many different denominations in my faith journey, and that has left me with a pretty unique perspective uh, that I hope to share with you guys today. Um, I've been a part of many different denominations. I was raised a Baptist, and then I moved into a non-denominational faith practice in my teens. Um, from there, I attended living room Bible studies through college, spent time in the UK where I got the opportunity to um, take communion at Westminster Abbey and uh, visit worship at St. Paul's Cathedral, um, returning home to serve at a Pentecostal church for a few years, and then finally the great uh, journey landed me here with all of you guys, and I joined the staff in 2021. All of this to say I absolutely love church. I know that's kind of strange, right? Some of us think of it as more of a chore that we have to do on Sundays, but I have always felt deeply connected to church and welcome at whatever church that I entered into. The institutions of our faith, along with the rituals and practices that accompany them, have always interested me, but I must confess that they've not mattered to me a great deal. I understand that that might put me at risk of offending some here today. That is not my intention. It is my intention, however, to challenge, and I hope that we do that here this morning. Today's second reading comes from the book of Romans and can be found on page 158 of your pew Bible. I will be reading from the NIV translation this morning. Romans 8, 22, Romans 8, verses 22 through 39. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to this present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. And he who might be born among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to all of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for all of us. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. 
And then who is it who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ, who died more than that, was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship, persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love that God has in Christ Jesus our Lord. So ends this reading. Think of a time when victory was completely assured in your life. When absolutely nothing could derail what would be certain victory. There aren't many areas. Sure, probable victory, but there are not many areas in which victory is completely assured. Something like a golden ticket that might take your favorite sports team all the way to the top. Something like a slightly deflated football, but only better. <laughs> maybe a race that you would be sure to win, absolutely no question. Or maybe a test or an exam that you know that you will ace absolutely no matter what, A+. Plus. Let me ask, if you have absolute assurance that you would succeed at something no matter what, how would you prepare for that task? If you knew you would win, would you practice for the race? If you knew you would ace it, would you study for the exam? Would you even bother to show up at all? I mean, what's the point of trying if the outcome is predetermined and that outcome is ultimately good for me? Our Romans passage today assures a lot of different things, victory being one of those, but also struggle. The passage promises glory, but it also promises pain. Anyone in the house ever struggle before? Anybody ever experience hardships? Just me? Oh, okay, a few more. Good, thank God. Because <laughs> as the kids say, the struggle is real. And I will also add that the struggle is guaranteed. I mean, for goodness sake, the passage we read today starts with a comparison of labor pains at childbirth. Nothing more painful, yet nothing more rewarding. There is no guarantee that we will not face struggles in our lives. I think exactly the opposite of that is true. Almost like all of the concepts mentioned in the Romans text are something that we can look for in our lives. Trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. For your sake, we face death all day long. Furthermore, death and life, angels and demons, present and future, all powers, our highs and our lows. But in all of this, we cling to the absolute truth that none of these hardships or difficulties can separate us from the love of God. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Our victory is our union with God, and our union is absolutely unbreakable. So what do we do then? That's truly up to us. We can let it roll out like a fairy tale ending. Boom, saved, the end, roll credits. As a child, I came up on many different Disney movies and Disney princess movies, um, a steady diet that uh, led me to believe that that's really the goal of life right there is just to find your prince charming and then voila, all of the woodland creatures will dance and all of the birds will sing and there'll be a full blown double rainbow across the sky and everything will be perfect. Your life is now complete, congratulations. And also over? Almost as if when those credits rolled, everybody in those stories just dropped dead all of a sudden. But at some point, it starts to dawn on us at those stories that that can't possibly have been the end. I mean, that appeared to actually just be the beginning. So many times we enter into a new relationship, there's going to be work and there's going to be many things that come along with that. It is not just over at the start. See, in the same way, believing and choosing Jesus can be the end, happily ever after, or it can be just the beginning. And for the sake of this sermon, let's pretend that we choose the latter. You see, our victory is our union, and our union is also an adventure. 
See, belief and faith is the bare minimum, but we are given the opportunity to make so much more out of our faith journey. And when we decide to make the most out of it, and when we take an active role in our faith, that's when growth truly happens. That is when discovery truly happens. That is when we go deeper, reach higher, and connect with God, the creator, on an entirely new level. And it's a wonder that the God of all creation beckons to us. The God of all majesty, goodness, and peace reaches for each and every one of us, desires for us, longs for us. Even when we fall short, even when we stumble, even when we hide from God. And we also know that even in our success and our celebrations, he also reaches for us. In all seasons of darkness and death, hope and change, rebirth and life, God reaches for us and beckons us into a new wholeness. And this is a journey that has no destination. There is no finish line with this race. It is a continuous adventure and a continuous journey. There's no ding of the oven letting you know that your Christian faith is ready and can now be served to all the people around you. It's a constant process. See, Paul writes to the church in Philippi in Philippians 3, 12 through 16. I'll be reading from the message. I am not saying that I have all of this together or that I've made it, but I am well on my way, reaching out for Christ who so wondrously reached out for me. Friends, don't get me wrong. By no means do I count myself an expert in any of this, but I've got my eye on the goal where God is beckoning us onward. To Jesus, I am off and running, and I am not turning back. So let's keep focused on that goal. Those of us who want everything God has for us, and any of you have something else in mind, something less than total commitment, God will clear your blurred vision. You'll see it. Now that we're on the right track, let's stay on it. See, friends, God is beckoning us onward. Don't look back. The past can surely captivate our minds, it seems, in times of uncertainty or distress. It does that quite well. See, for some of us, the past is a safe place where things were common or predictable, stable even. For some of us, the past is a place of fear, isolation, and silence. For some, the past is a place of regret and sadness, a place we really wish that we could erase. But for good or bad, that is part of our story, but it does not have to be our entire story. As long as we have breath in our bodies, God is reaching for us, beckoning us to go on to the next level, to go deeper still. And we every day get the opportunity to focus and reach for all that God has for us. It's messy and at times painful. Inconvenient, sure, but highly rewarding. As the Roman text reminds us, we must not give up. Of course, giving up is a choice. Pressing forward is also a choice. You can give up. You can stop reaching. You can stop participating. But what happens when an athlete stops training? What happens to a relationship when you stop communicating? What happens to a garden that you stop watering or a tree that no longer grows? What good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister without clothes or daily food, if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Yikes. That's the call to action of all call to actions. A reminder that Our words really only mean what's behind them. I don't read this as a rebuke on laziness or disinterest necessarily, but more of a call of a question. If your faith does not motivate you to some form of action, be it physical or abstract, is that faith alive and real to you? It's like having a personal motto or creed that is not evident anywhere in your life. Those of you who know me, would know that if I told you that my personal motto was the early bird gets the worm, you would look at me like I'm a crazy person and like I'm delusional. 
because I struggle with perpetual tardiness, in case you didn't know. <laughs> to get everything that God has for us and to make our faith more than just one hour on Sunday will require our participation. Notice that the text does not say faith without a large congregation is dead. It does not say faith without young families or children is dead. And it does not say faith without a minister who represents 100% of my political and cultural views is dead. It does say that faith without any buy-in or investment from you and I and us might as well be dead. So as long as we continue to show up and allow our faith to shape our thoughts and our actions, friends, we are not dead yet. As long as there is breath still in our bodies, God is not done with us. Ultimately, much of this comes down to you and I and the choices that we make going forward. Yes, our union is absolutely assured. It's not our salvation that we are working towards, but it is growth that we want to work towards and that will take work from us. We can choose to tend our spiritual garden and take action that will facilitate growth in us and growth in others. We can heed the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not give up and reach toward God. We can bring our thoughts into captivity. We can tame our tongues. We can be peacemakers. Or we can do whatever we want, but the fruits that we bear will speak for our spiritual state. Galatians 5, 13 through 26 says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by one another. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires that is contrary to the Spirit and the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. And there are conflict within each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions and factions, envy, drunkenness, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. See, we want to yield of the good stuff. Talking about love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we want to produce the best yield personally in our own lives and collectively as a body, we're going to need to tend the garden. Sometimes that's going to mean making difficult decisions. See, if a tree branch becomes brittle and cannot weather hardships, if a tree branch does not green out and use the sun's rays to make food for the body, if a, pre if a tree branch does not bear good fruit or bears diseased fruit, that branch is either dead or diseased and needs to be pruned. See, it's not just about desiring growth and wholeness and hoping for it in our own lives, but it's also about making space for it when we have the opportunity. We might be called to be fruit inspectors at times, where we inspect the fruits produced by our actions, maybe even on occasion help our brothers and sisters to inspect their fruits as well, and use the help of the Holy Spirit to discern, discern what to keep in our lives and what to cut away. Because days come and go with remarkable speed, and the more we allow the acts of the flesh to take nutrients and focus away from the fruits of the Spirit, we're more at risk of losing sight of the goal, which is to reach for all that God has for us. And as long as there is breath in our bodies, let it be our goal to grow deeply in love with God and to allow that relationship to flourish. And from that relationship, 
we can shape our love for one another. In the coming months, we will begin a new chapter again here at First Presbyterian Church. And just as we have the opportunity to reach for God in all that he has for us in our personal lives, we also get the opportunity to reach for all that God has for First Presbyterian Church of Farmington. And also, just as there is an element of personal responsibility in your faith, there is an element of personal responsibility to the body that we serve. We know that no one person is going to come along and suddenly make all of, all of the things happen that could happen here at First Presbyterian Church. The things that you and I and we want to see happen. But we can certainly do it together as, the, as life in the body was meant to be done together and in cooperation with one another. There are plenty of opportunities for growth here and I'm not only talking about the numbers. Let us help each other to reach for more because this church is not dead until we decide or allow it. I invite each and every one of us to think creatively about how we can facilitate growth in our own lives, in every season, and in whatever role that we play here at the church or your roles that you play outside of these church walls. We can consult the Holy Spirit and reflect on what fruit is being bared, what is good fruit and what might be missing the mark, and remember that this family, this family of God, this family of believers is really worth being a part of. And each one of us belongs here. God first reached for us because of his relentless love, a love so beyond comprehension that we are invited to get lost in the experience of it. And that love, friends, which cannot be removed from any one of us, is the ultimate point of it all. Amen. We come now to a time of prayer. Um, the pencil. Does anyone have any prayers to come before the body today? Yes, I do hear that. do our prayers, Jim Ramata. Okay. Whose who's wife, a loving and generous writer and, and teacher, Vicki, died suddenly this week. Okay. So Leroy Miller has suffered a stroke. Any others? All right, let us pray. Creator God, we thank you so much. God, we thank you that we get to be a part of an amazing family. God, we thank you that we get to be a part of an amazing church and an amazing community, God. God, we thank you so much for the love that you graciously pour out, God. It's a wonder that you reach to us each and every day, Father God. And I just pray that that love is abundantly known, God. And if any of us should struggle with our place in this family and our role in a life with you, God, I pray that you will clear our vision. God, and I hope that your love and that your purpose is so much louder than any other struggles of our lives, the struggles of our faith, God the disappointments in that which we experience every single day, God. We pray for your abundant love. God, we pray for your peace for Jim Ramica and the passing of Vicki. God, we pray that your grace and your peace and your love overshadows so many painful things, God. We pray, pray for Leroy Miller, who has suffered a stroke, God. We pray for your for your healing, for your peace, for the family, God. We pray that your presence will be abundantly known to everyone suffering from loss or hardship or brokenness, physical pain. God, reign over us with your abundant love.
Now we will pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join in our sending hymn, number 546, Lord, dismiss us with your blessing. Spirit, God has given you the gift of discernment to resist evil, choose what is good, and guide your feet on the way of peace. May God, who searches the heart, Jesus, whose love overcomes all division, and the Spirit, which helps us in our weakness, continue to lead you into life, that you may serve with abandon and joy. <laughs> 